I think everyone here has some interesting things to say. So we've been talking a lot about uh, the author, re, uh, re, re getting retouched with the author, the author becoming the brand, the author being in control, worrying about author needs. And everyone here on this panel is doing something in regard to providing author services. Uh, Mike Wishman from Plum Anal Analytics. I could be helpful, I could talk. Um, Jay Kelleher from CCC. Sarah Tagan from ACS, and specifically Chemworks. And Melinda Kenaway from Kudos. Uh, what I was hoping, since they know what they're doing far better than I do, that they would introduce themselves and just let us know a little bit about who you are, where you work, and how you're supporting author needs. I guess I'm starting. We'll, we'll go right to left. Uh, can you guys hear me? Oh, that sounds a little better. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mike Bushman. I know some of you. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, I am a librarian. Uh, I was a corporate librarian for Microsoft for five years, um, about 10 years ago. And then I went into the uh, product space. Uh, I was the original program manager for Microsoft Academic Search. How many people remember that product? Uh, okay, good. I did that a couple weeks ago in the UK and it was pretty sad. I don't know how many people, I was like, man, two <laughs> years of my life, you know. Um, uh, shortly thereafter, I worked for the IEEE for a little bit and then uh, I was the uh, um, product manager for Summon, the, the Serial Solutions Discovery product from its inception. It was there that I met uh, Andrew Mihalik, who's the director of, uh, of technology for Summon. We worked together every day for four years and decided to go into business together. Um, we we uh, incorporated Plum Analytics in January of 2012 and uh, we were acquired by EBSCO this year in January. Uh, you may have heard that and we're, we're very happy about uh, how, that, how that's been going. Um, I originally came to this problem uh, when I was in the library, uh, I was supporting Microsoft Research, and uh, a couple guys there had had an idea of, look, we've got this algorithm, and we think we can figure out who the rising stars are in electrical engineering and computer science, and we can recruit them before they they have tenure, right? And and they know what they they're locked in. So I uh, arranged to get the Thompson. Uh, uh, data for them for this uh, for this algorithm to put it through their process and uh, and they worked on it for several months about six months and um, it was a failure because they found stars not rising stars right because the citation data you know we've talked a little bit about uh, you know its problems and stuff but I mean one of the big things is it's a lagging indicator right by the time you publish and then get the citations you're going to get. It can be three to five years, right? And if if somebody says, "Hey, how was that? How was that publication or the article you wrote last year doing?" and you say, "Well, I'll let you know in three years," it's very unsatisfying, right? It's uh, uh, it's not the way not the way you want to go. So that's where I, that's the germ of the idea uh, of what we've been doing, and and other things that we've been uh, doing with authors have also um, come with my career. Um, when we first did academic search, I would show it to, to researchers, and of course, what's the first thing they want to do when we talk about egocentrism, right? Hey, where are my 10 papers, right? Uh, so we'll do a search, and, and the same thing with Summon, right? And the same thing with Plum, when we do researcher pro profiles. If you have 11 out of their 14 papers, you'll not be able to talk about what you want to talk about um, until, you, uh, until you talk about the three missing papers. Right, um, authors definitely are aware of what they what they're doing, and uh, want to know what's going on. And so, by providing that uh, uh, those metrics to them, there's a, a, a feedback loop, and they want to constantly uh, go back to that and see how they're doing. Um, just real quickly, um, already in the two years we've been doing this, two years plus. I mean, there's so many metrics out there that are happening. And um, when Andrew and I first started, it was. Uh, it was to solve this problem, and about two, two months into it, we heard of this thing called Altmetrics, right? We, we did not set out to do an Altmetrics company. Uh, we sort of ran into this idea, because we were still tracking researchers and alternative uh, uh, w uh, output besides articles, right, were important to us. But the least common denominator part is that uh, article, uh, um, article level metrics. And so we, uh, we did that to, uh, as, as well as uh, some other people in the field. Um, but we already have enough metrics that we've had to categorize them to make sense of them. 
And one of the things we like to say is we're not really an altmetrics company, we're an all metrics company because everything matters, right? Citations still matter, usage in all forms matters greatly, right? When you talk to researchers, say, look, I'm, I'm import uh, it's important about my citation information, probably the most important thing, right? Well, if it's too early, what, else, what do you want to know next? How many people are downloading my article, right? That's going to be the next thing. And then there are the other three categories of information that are more attentionist. How many people are capturing my stuff? How many people are saving it for later? How many people are commenting on it? Uh, what is the promotional aspect of the uh, uh, going on in social media, for instance? Um, so I'll leave it there. I think I took, I took some time. So My name is Jake Kelleher. I'm Senior Director of Licensing and Business Development um, with the Copyright Clearance Center. I've been with CCC almost 10 years. Um, I'm here to talk about our RightSync for Open Access solution. Um, it, it really is a, is a product that's evolved to, to really take to handle the complexities of open access uh, for publishers. Um, we have been handling author um, payments since 2004, uh, color charges, page charges, author reprints. Uh, and I, I remember um, in 2006, it was October, um, we were having a, a strategy session with Taylor and Francis, and they came to our, our offices and uh, said, hey, um, we've got a mandate, it's October now, we have a mandate to have an open access solution uh, by December. Um, can you help us? And uh, I sat there and go, hmm, um, we've got two months to do this, right? Um, but but the, we were in the workflow between the publisher and the author already, handling page charges, color charges, reprints. We said, let us think about this. Um, we, we, we captured their business requirements. We said, you know, what do you need? How do you price? You know, how do you determine discounts, that kind of thing? Um, and, and we did indeed roll out our first uh, open access solution. Um, uh, it was December 27th or something. Uh, we met the deadline, um, and we've been enhancing the, the product ever since. Uh, more recently, I'd say over the last two years, um, with, with the complexities and the, and the mandates from funders and institutions, um, the, the product has, has to become more robust, so we've invested heavily in, 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 in adding new features. Um, also leveraging emerging standards. You know, think about ORCID, how important that is, um, identifying authors um, and, and making it easy for them to transact. Uh, Ringgold, so we, we can identify institutions. Um, so having that information pass to us in metadata. Um, and one of the things we've really, uh, that we're about to launch in May, it's, it's exciting, it's with Erie's editorial manager. Um, the, the author goes through a certain workflow. They're, they're you know, submitting their manuscript. Um, so they have a, an existing workflow. Um, what we're doing is having our product talk to Erie's editorial manager. So the two products talk back and forth. Um, so prior to the author even submitting the manuscript, we can pass information in their workflow and say, hey, if you want to submit this as open access, it's going to cost you whatever the publisher's fee is. Um, and if we get information back from Aries, and we know this author is a certain author using an, an ORCID ID, we can say, oh, this author is entitled to certain discounts because of a, a you know, a, a certain, they're part of a certain institution or they're part of a Hanari country, whatever. Um, but that information gets passed back and forth um, and it removes the speed bumps for the author, allows them to, to transact with the publisher within their current existing workflow. After, after um, acceptance, they can place their order, uh, again, within the Aries er, uh, editorial manager, launch RightsLink, pay their fee, and off they go. So um, our newest version is coming out um, at the end of May uh, this year. I'm Sarah Tegan. I'm Vice President for Global Editorial and Author Services at the American Chemical Society. Um, so the remit for for Global Editorial and Author Services is that I'm responsible for a peer review system. Our publications help desk are 400 editorial offices and for ACS Chemworks, which is what I'm going to speak to about today. So ACS Chemworks was launched uh, just a little bit more than a year ago, and we're very pleased to have been awarded the PSP's uh, Best New App or E-Product uh, this year uh, in February. So ACS Chemworks is part reference manager plus document sharing um, plus metadata sharing engine. And it's really, uh, for us, focused on researchers in chemistry and, and related sciences. Um, we think that we make it really easy for users to get into ACS Chemworks. <coughs> and one of the ways that we do that, one of our front doors, is through something that we call ACS ActiveView PDF. 
uh, which is a flash-based rendering of our composed articles um, that allows users to be able to interact with the references, very easily interact with the supplemental information, very easily take uh, annotations on their articles. And that's a project that my colleague Jeff Lang here in the audience today um, heads up, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer questions uh, during the reception later. Um, but uh, it, it makes it easy then for an, an author to interact with ACS content and then store uh, their, their data, their annotated data, their annotated article into their own ChemWorks library. Um, the library collaboration document sharing aspects of ACS ChemWorks are uh, powered by our partner CallWiz. Um, you'll hear from Stuart uh, during the next section. Um, so I know that, that Stuart and Tahir Mansouri, they're the CEO of CallWiz, are here and would also be delighted to talk with you about their product. So then we sort of talk a little bit more about the author ego, the, the topic of this session. And the other part of ACS ChemWorks is something that we call our publishing center, um, which is really becoming our one-stop shop for all interactions uh, of our authors, our readers, our reviewers with ACS publications. So our researchers can track this, the, the status of their submitted articles or their um, due dates for referee reports uh, within ACS ChemWorks, and that's through a loose integration with our Scholar One Manuscripts partner. Um, I feel like this is a bit of a commercial for all of our <laughs> vendors. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, we, we also um, are focusing on some of our new authors, our new reviewers, and we have certificates of appreciation that they can download saying, hey, this is your first published article with ACS Publications. Here's a, a pretty certificate that's, you know, um, acceptable for framing or emailing to your mom. Um, uh, so that's always good, too. Um, we also provide article level metrics to our authors. We all know that authors' egos are big, and you're right, you have to have all of their publications, otherwise it doesn't matter to them. Um, but we, uh, we decided that we would show them what's the geographic breakdown of the, the articles uh, that, are, that they've published. And I was pretty skeptical about this at first. I sort of thought, well, it's going to be kind of relatively um, evenly distributed, um, just sort of according to what our usage looks like. And it turns out it's actually pretty different um, per paper. So we think that people are, are pretty psyched to be able to see where their, their papers are downloaded. Of course, we also be, uh, provide um, uh, citation counts, which are powered through our sister company, um, uh, the Chemical Abstract Service, and, and their product, SciFinder. Um, and then we also know that uh, our users really want to be um, up to date on the literature. They're terrified. They're paranoid about being scooped, that they have missed something in the literature. So we've provided them with a set of current awareness tools as well. We've got an RSS feed, a Twitter feed. That isn't just specific to ACS publications information. You can enter whatever URLs you want in, in your RSS feed. You can follow whatever Twitter people you want to keep up to date with the literature. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we didn't sort of, oh, I guess the other thing I'll say about that too is that um, the publishing center is becoming our home for ACS's open access offering. So we've got four different things that we're, we're offering this year. And we now have apps within our publishing center that support that. Um, and we're very much looking forward to your release of uh, the software. We are too. <laughs> um, to be able to power that, uh, that a little bit better as well. Um, you know, we didn't sort of just run into this willy-nilly. We did a bunch of research of the past several years, um, starting with a survey of our authors and readers. We had about 10,000 respondents. Um, and, uh, you know, what was really clear was that researchers were looking for easy ways to be able to manage their reference library and share data with their colleagues. Um, and data not just, you know, sort of research data, but data, uh, metadata about their articles. You know, for, for so long, um, it was just so easy to be able to say, I'm going to go to a publisher's website, I'm going to download this PDF, I'm going to print it out, I'm going to read it. And then when I need to go back to that PDF, rather than going and searching for it on my desktop, I'm just going to go back to the publisher's website, who's done a whole lot better job of curating it than I have on my own desktop, and just re-download it. So if you can um, have a, a system that, that marries both the metadata um, with an article and the PDF of the article into one easy-to-use system, that's a really great service for our users. And, and we find that they're, they're using that. Um, we also know that the ability to be able to share information between researchers is important. Um, they want to be able to share citations, uh, metadata information about the articles in their library. They want to be able to, to cite from one library when they're writing papers. I'm sort of kludgy right now to, to work between a bunch of systems. Um, and I think that the data are borne out. What we see people using within ACS ChemWorks is what they responded uh, in our survey several years ago that was what they wanted. Okay, last but not least, I hope. Um, my name's Melinda Kenaway, and I'm the director of a marketing services company. 
called TBI Communications, and also a new startup um, called QDOS. I'm the co-director and uh, founder of that organization. And I think the sort of uh, respective contributions to my mortgage of those two companies is nicely reflected by my name badge. <laughs> now, I have TBI printed in elegant letters on my name badge, and I've scrawled on in, in biro QDOS as well. So that's kind of the, the state of those two companies. Um, but it's, it's very exciting to be part of a, a startup. And QDOS is a web-based service that helps, was designed to help authors maximize the impact of their publications. And um, we take a very broad view on what a publication is. Uh, articles are obviously a priority kind of content, but also book chapters, books, and potentially other kind of research outputs as well. Anything with the DOI can be included in QDOS. So the idea for QDOS came about really because of the long tail challenge that we have in our industry. We know we have a, a lot of content that is rarely cited, and, and I'm sad to say some that's rarely read as well. Um, I was very taken by a quote that uh, Fred Diller, uh, who's in the audience today from AIP, used at a, a conference last week to say that the challenge today for us is less about access and much more about discoverability. And QDOS is very much a, a response to that challenge and, and hopefully will be part of many tools that will emerge in this space to help with that. So I've worked in this industry for over 20 years. I spent uh, an awful lot of time and money marketing um, to encourage readers for content. And 10 years ago, I was marketing director for the journals division at OUP. And I used to think, how can I um, empower my authors to market their own work? Because there are thousands and thousands of them, and only one of me. Um, it, it seems that there's an efficiency here if we can just motivate them and give them some tools to do this kind of work. Um, more than just me trying to save myself some, some time and money, um, this was much more to do with the fact that authors had the networks, and they had the knowledge, and they had the passion about their work to be the best possible people to share it and talk about it. Um, so I, I left OUP 10 years ago with that on my mind, and, and I've been very busy consulting ever since. But, but that idea sort of came back to me last year. And I thought, you know, things are changing now. We've, we've got the tools. Um, we've got new channels. And also, with the emergence of things like all metrics, uh, authors are starting to have the motivation to really look at the performance of their work. So it was with that in mind um, that with a couple of colleagues, we got chatting to some publishers we were working with at the time, um, AIP, Taylor & Francis, Royal Society of Chemistry, and said, what do you think about this idea? And they said, hey, it sounds great. It fits our strategy. We, we're interested in author services. We're interested in, in maximizing research, uh, readership. So, so let's go for it. And they, they funded us starting a pilot, which we ran towards the end of last year. Um, over a 14-week period, we built a fairly um, rough-and-ready prototype site with the idea of simply seeing, would people use this tool? Would they come in and register? Um, would they use some of the sharing um, tools that we had? And we were um, kind of pleased with, with the results. Uh, we, we invited 40,000 authors to use the site, and we um, thought, well, if by the end of 14 weeks we've got 1,000 registered, that, that's great. Um, but we actually had 1,000 register within the first 24 hours. And then by the end of the 14 weeks, we had over 5,500 researchers registered to use the service, uh, which was 12% of the people that we invited. And, and having many years in product development behind me, that's a pretty good um, response by anybody's standards. So, you know, certainly the, the interest was there. Um, we also did quite a comprehensive online survey and had 4,000 researchers answer a number of questions about their interest in using these tools and so on. Um, and again, a huge amount of interest in wanting to do this work. Um, when we asked, do you think more can be done to increase the impact and visibility um, of your work after publication, 84% said yes. And then we said, well, who should be responsible for doing this work? Um, rate yourself against these other, these other groups. And they put themselves top ahead of publishers, co-authors, institutions, funders. They want to do this work. And then we described the sort of tools that QDOS would offer and said, well, who would use this? Would it be you, your lab assistant, anybody? Um, and the response was 75% said, I would personally want to use these tools. 
So we had um, some of that research behind us which seemed to validate the idea. Um, very early results coming out of the pilot system were that people using the sharing tools were seeing something like 19% extra uh, downloads for their articles. And actually, um, I, some of the authors were having hundreds of click-throughs from the sharing activities. So those that have really got behind these new channels are having amazing responses. And part of Kudos's mission is to help more people do that and, and do it better. How's this? <laughs> Actually, if you might want to take this one. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions of the people here, but I was hoping that you all would be thinking of the questions that you might have. So I would get us started. I have plenty to take us through the time we have for sure, but it would be much better to answer your questions than ours, which we've kind of already talked about a little bit. So everyone here was very gracious and uh, gave me a demonstration of their respective systems. And um, one of the things that occurred to us as we were looking over each other's uh, products and services here is that most authors interact across publisher. They're interacting with different publishers and they might have a favorite. They might be predominantly an ACS publisher, but they may also publish with others and certainly want to read the works and cite the works of others. So starting with Sarah, I was wondering if you could tell us how do you meet the needs of authors to work across publishers? Well, uh, of course we like to think that ACS is first among equals and we can meet every researcher's every need, um, but then I wake up and I live in the real world. So, you know, um, the, the, pro the, the problem for authors is, right, they want their, their research to be read really broadly, but they want to, and they want to publish in the highest impact journal for them. So what we really need to make sure that, that we do for authors is, is to ensure that their research can be broadly found. So we are fortunate that we get to partner with the Chemical Abstract Service with their, um, with their SciFinder uh, product, um, which spans across the chemical literature. So by, by integrating um, with SciFinder, by saying, hey, you can search SciFinder from here if you log in, um, that is one step at getting people across the, the literature. Um, as I mentioned a little while ago in my introduction, right, we've got an RSS feed and a, and a Twitter feed um, that are publisher agnostic, that it's really up to the researcher to figure out what they want to look at. I guess the final thing that I will say is that um, we make it very easy from the ACS publications web pages to be able to add uh, articles to an author's library so they, that they can read, but we also have a web importer tool that you can stick, it's, a, it's on your a uh, toolbar in your, your browser, kind of like a Pinterest uh, button um, that allows people to download citations from other publishers' websites and add those to their library. So we think that by, by trying to be comprehensive across the, the, the literature, we try to make it easy for researchers to be able to find the information they need. Anyone want to talk about how they're, I mean, you're all, not, obviously, you're all offering services and the rest of you are not publishers. So why don't we flip the question around and say, why should publishers be interested in your services for their authors? Melinda, you want to start? <laughs> we'll go this way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so when, when we came up with this idea for QDOS, as I said, I had previously sat in OUP and thought, how can I, how can I give tools um, for my authors to, to do this work? Um, and I went around in my consulting life for the next 10 years and talked to more publishers about them saying, well, we also want our authors to be able to use these tools. And, and we've got some guidelines and we've got some ideas for how we might do this. Um, but for anybody who knows a researcher, you will know they deal with multiple, multiple publishers, particularly in the biosciences. They could publish a dozen articles in a year with a dozen different publishers. And no researcher in the world is going to want to use a whole different set of tool sets for, for promoting and sharing their articles. Um, in, um, from individual publishers. So um, fr from our point of view, it was really critical and important that we sat independently from any one publisher to create that, that platform. Um, so I, I just don't think it's an idea that, that, that can work from a single publisher. Yeah, I, it, as far as it, it relates to rights, like um, portability is important. Um, when an when author signs up with RightsLink, they use that one RightsLink across um, all the pub rights and publisher accounts. Uh, that way they're not logging in, you know, over and over in different different times. Uh, the other thing, a direction we are moving in, we're not there yet, is, is single sign-on so that when we integrate with the publisher, we whatever sign-on they have, we're, we're hopefully going to be able to, to use that and, and just have them uh, set up a rights and account without having to set up a rights and account. There's really two aspects of uh, what we can do here. One is for authors themselves or, or for your authors. 
So providing ways to see their own metrics, um, what's going on in their articles, their co-authors, right? But there's also a sort of administrative um, angle, right, of looking at authors against each other or authors uh, in different issues or journals versus uh, my competitors' authors and journals, right? That's not, that's not necessarily an author uh, author level benefit, but uh, a publisher level benefit uh, as well. So. so, are there questions from the audience at all yet? I have more. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully we'll get a couple, but. Um, Moving down the list here, um, what about internationally? One of the things that came up on one of our phone calls was, um, do the needs of authors vary internationally? How so, and how do you address that? You want to start with Melinda again? Um, well, so in, in the survey that, that we ran, we didn't find a huge amount of international differences in that all authors want the highest possible usage citations, visibility for their work, and most authors feel that they're um, is more potential for that. I think the one point that's maybe relevant to this question is that um, some of the research I've read indicates that authors in maybe more the developing world are more hungry for success for their work. And perhaps in the Western world, we may be a little bit more complacent. Um, I'm not going to use these sharing tools. You know, I published in a journal with Impact Factor X, and, and, and that will be it. Um, but for people who are really um, wanting to make a difference to their work, they, they can do. And, and I think we'll see some strong regional differences uh, in the usage of, of QDOS now that we've launched the full service site. But that's just a prediction. <laughs> so, uh, you know, from our perspective, it's, the, there are some differences. It's, it's usually governments that cause the problems internationally. You know, taxes, VAT taxes. Um, there's a new standard for invoicing in, in, in the UK. So those kind of things cause you to have to, 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 to change. Um, Multi-currency, um, you know, I think we support, you know, up to se at least seven different currencies because authors, some authors like to pay in yen, others like to pay in the pound, some like to pay in euro, some like to pay in US dollar. So you have to accommodate those as well. So I think from my perspective, dealing directly with authors when they're getting a manuscript ready to submit, um, we, we do see some distinct needs for our international uh, audience. I mean, as you may well imagine, you know, the, the plurality of our submissions come from China, for instance, um, and we still have a plenty of, of manuscripts that are rejected for, say, English language considerations. So for us, we've been able to start tailoring um, uh, offerings, um, English editing services um, that, uh, you know, that are ACS ChemWorks branded um, that allow authors to say, hey, I'll give my paper the best shot. Um, for us, this is kind of a nice benefit because those are add-on services, so it's a, it's a revenue stream for one of these scientific social networks, which um, has been a sort of a difficult uh, nut to break. Um, but we think that there is probably a, a market for, for those kinds of, of tools and services that, um, that would help uh, international authors with the things that they struggle with. I'd just like to uh, echo what, what Melinda said to some extent. I think there's this, you know, the, the citation regime is sort of a Matthews effect, the rich get richer, right? And so if you're in the developing uh, uh, research area, whether it's international or not, it tends to be uh, international, but it, but it certainly can be here where you're starting a new research program or your, your uh, institution is starting to do more research. How do you break into that old boys network of uh, showing that, that you're really doing valuable stuff, right? Um, it can be difficult. So some of the stuff we have is, is a little more um, uh, easily uh, uh, available for those, for those folks, yeah. Actually, following on with you, Mike, one of the things that I thought was interesting in our conversation on the phone was the idea of what kind of decisions would someone mm -hmm. make because of the metrics you provide? How does that help an author in any way make any decisions, or anyone, a publisher? Right, yeah. We'll talk about, I mean, we're here to talk about authors, so I guess so let's, <laughs> let's talk about authors. Um, in the same way, and, uh, you know, this came up uh, in our conversation, I mean, and, and I've talked to other people about it before. Did, how many people un know Fitbit? It's uh, on my Oh, wrist. wow. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's definitely different. Talk about international difference, right? <laughs> uh, I was in the UK a couple weeks ago, there were like two people, but then I'm also like, I'm not sure that's the right question to ask a, a full audience, too. Um, but 
if you're familiar with it, right, all it's doing is providing you the metrics on how long you walked or how many stairs you climbed, right? And, and just that knowledge, just that feedback of information uh, lets you make decisions, right? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk a little, you know, that other half mile today to reach my goal, right? Just just having that that knowledge where you know a year ago you'd be walking and you'd be like, oh, that was pretty good, right? That's now oh, it's like actually 3.5. I got to get the four or whatever whatever it is, right? And in the same way, when authors are getting these metrics, there there are any number of things they're looking at, but some of them, if they're getting metrics from certain providers, where am I going to publish next, right? Uh, I, uh, I seem to be getting a lot of metrics from uh, open access providers that provide article level metrics, uh, as well as all this interaction where it's freely available. Um, and I'm not getting as much from uh, my commercial uh, publishers. Mm, everything being equal, maybe next time I'll publish open access, right? Uh, that's a decision that, that absolutely they can make. Um, I've been told I've got a deposit into PubMed Central or my institutional repository and it seems like a pain, seems like something else uh, that uh, somebody's making me do that I, that's taking me away from my research, right? What good am I getting out of it? All of a sudden now I'm getting metrics uh, in my institutional repository. I can see how many people are using my, uh, my article that's uh, the PubMed version of my article now uh, through these tools. Next time I'm going to make sure it's in there earlier, right? Not wait till somebody makes me. So there are a lot of decisions that, that uh, authors are going to be making, and, and as people are saying, if authors are kings, um, you know, having that, that knowledge is going to make them make, make decisions there. Questions? Tell us about the types of collaborations that you're seeing with your services, and how important is it to future you know? um, Well, certainly standards collaborations are, are really important. Um, so for, for us, we're working with, with Ringgold and Orchid and Crossref, and you know, with, without these organizations, a service like, like QDOS, when I first sort of thought about it 10 years ago, wouldn't have been possible. So it, the joining up of a number of data points are, are really, uh, really important. And actually, um, my experience, too, of developing the, the full site, um, which we've done with, in partnership with 25 publishers, has actually been, the, the industry is incredibly collaborative. Everybody has to compete to some degree, but also there, there's the will and the interest in shaping a service that's going to be of common value to, to everybody. So that's my, my view on collaboration. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier that our collaboration with Aries, um, we're, we're speaking with other uh, manuscript management systems. We think that's critical so that the, the author has a, has a nice experience. Publishers love the idea. Um, you know, you really want one easy uh, workflow. Um, we've done this with re reprint partners for, for publishers for years, where we capture reprint orders on behalf of the publisher. We route it to the printer. The printer prints it and ships it to the customer. All that information is contained in our, in our uh, rights link system, so they know where the status of orders. But, you know, the publishers have lots of di different partners, and, and, and they really want you to, to try to collaborate as much as possible and, and not raise the price at the same time. Um, hi there. So, question on alt metrics, um, and with the increase in in the different types of metrics, how do you guard against misuse? For example, like downloading, it's a lot easier to do than writing another paper and citing. So, how do you guard against potential, you know, farming of download clicks and the like? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, and and. Uh, all the source data has its problems, just in the same way that there's been misuse of citations for 50 years as well, right? Um, it, it, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, we're definitely gonna have to guard against in, in different ways, right? And look at that and see uh, what's going on. But uh, especially in the usage area, even though they're a counter, you know, standard, right? It, it, it's going to be variable even among those. And if people are, are hitting it from the same place, are there sources knowing that these are unique hits, for instance, or are people coming in from different ways? But it's a good question. Another question? Yes. All you, Judy. All right. What do you think the impact will be on journals with the focus now shifting down to the author level? And all of our mm -hmm. metrics, all of the, the business models have been around journals. Well, 
I think we're, we're shifting towards a world of competing for authors. And um, I, I gave a presentation on this just a couple of weeks ago at UKSG and talked about how unprepared we are as an industry for that. Um, but you've only got to look at the fact that we had an institutional identifier in place 10, 15 years ago. And uh, we're only just now working out an author identifier because we haven't had to compete for authors before. You know, it was open access that, that um, has brought this along. And I have a very strong memory of when I was at um, OUP of changing nucleic acids research, one of our biggest, most profitable journals, into an open access journal overnight and suddenly thinking, my gosh, I've got to now communicate to our authors and tell them to start paying us when there's plenty of other places for them to go and not be paid um, and not have to pay. So um, this, this whole sort of competing for author world is going to require us to, to get much closer to, to our authors and understand the kinds of um, services we need to provide that they want and, and the people that do that best are going to be the ones that survive. I think if I can offer sort of maybe a, a slightly different perspective as well, I think that the, everything that Melinda, you said is absolutely correct, but I think that the, the, the other side of the equation that we're ignoring is that time is still a finite commodity and there are people who still have to read these articles. And I think that the, the journal brand still um, indicates something about the quality of the articles in, uh, in that are published, right? And so it gives, uh, gives readers the opportunity to sort of say, well, this is one I might pay a little bit more attention to, or this might be one that I, I still pay a little bit of less attention to. So I think that there is still marketing to be done to readers as to the quality of the brand that you publish. And just sort of allied to that, the, the rise of um, post-publication peer review and rating systems and then, you know, who is, is citing and using content becoming more important even than, than the journal, journal wrapper. Um, so lots of, lots of change, I think, on this front to come. We have one more in the back. Um, what protection can you offer uh, the authors uh, from predatory publishers? namely those who really are just scamming because they now have much more opportunity to make a bob or two directly from prospective authors. It's funny, we were just talking about that this week um, uh, with, with people. It's, it's a huge problem, right? And, and thinking, you know, for me all, all encompassing about uh, about metrics. What can we? If, is there a place for us to help in this problem that's real? And we're still figuring that out. I mean, um, I'm not sure the answer for us. I mean, we're, it, is there something in the measurements that are going to help people understand that uh, this is this isn't the right way? But it's a huge problem. I think measurements will link to brand ultimately. I mean, and I think what what has always attracted authors has been even higher than the impact factor perceived reputation of the publisher. That's the number one reason why authors submit according to an ALP survey from a few years ago. Um, so at, at the moment, um, I think there are new brands coming into the marketplace and it's very difficult for authors to judge which ones are quality uh, and so on. And all that will gradually be sorted out probably through some of the, the metrics that we're going to have to say, um, these are the publishers that actually give your work impact. And that may differ hugely in terms of the the field you're in, the career stage that you're in, um, and how, law, how authors learn which brands they should publish with will, will have to be driven by that, that kind of metrics analysis. And, oh, okay, one last one in the back. <laughs> things. One thing that everybody doesn't necessarily pay attention to, although everybody knows about Bill's List. Uh, Bill's List is, a, yeah. is on a platform which is on, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, um, I, I, I just blanked. So Bill's List on, on a platform that is uh, WordPress, sorry, WordPress, which is not available in China. So people in China have absolutely no idea what Bill's List is. They do not have access to it. They do not have knowledge of it. And unfortunately for our industry, Beals List is probably one of the only catalogs of what predatory journals represent. And uh, so I have urged in other venues, I'll urge in this venue, people need to rally and help Jeffrey Beal financially take his list and put it on a platform, an HTML platform that gets through the great Chinese firewall. It is the first step to educating the Chinese authors about predatory publishing. That's the least we can do. 
Well, I would like to wrap this up and thank our speakers and also just kind of point out that although we're talking about the author ecosystem and you're all contributing greatly to the ease um, with which authors interact um, with publishers, there's the publisher side of that too. So obviously it's a symbiotic relationship. And thank you all for participating. Thanks. Thanks.